So next we have Neil uh, Hosby uh, from Google uh, Brain Jurich. Uh, Neil Hosby is a senior staff research scientist in Google Brain Jurich. He has broad interest in machine learning and artificial intelligence with particular, particular focus on scalable models, vision, language, and the generalization. Today, uh, Neil will talk about architecture beyond seeing and, and the video scanning laws. So Neil, welcome, please, this your time. Okay, okay yes, yes, I can, I can get, get started. started. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Matthias. So, yeah, yeah my, my name is Neil, Neil and I work in the Google Brain team and uh, based in Zurich. And I'd, I'd like, like to start, start by thank you very much the workshop organizers for putting together this super well-organized workshop, the elevator paid benchmark and, and challenge. And this, this workshop really aligns very well with our way of thinking about uh, going about tackling the division problems. And workshop organizers are very kind in letting myself, Shawa, and uh, Matthias have our talks back to back. So I will start by giving a bit more background and motivation on our work on architectures and um, visual representation learning. And then I'll talk a little bit about our work on visual scaling laws. Shawa will then uh, speak about multimodal image and text learning, and Matthias about using these models for tasks beyond image classification. Next, please. So first, we know there's been a lot of progress in computer vision over the last 10 years, and this can be seen by the progress on ImageNet. And this has been driven to a large extent by innovations in neural architectures and methods to scale them. However, we know that ImageNet is maybe a bit overused, and I probably don't need to tell the members of this workshop that we should be looking to sort of more uh, challenging benchmarks and tasks for evaluating our progress. Next, please. And so, really, what we're trying to do is build models that are pre trained models that are capable of addressing a wide variety of different uh, challenges, metrics, and benchmarks. Uh, when we can transfer them. So improve accuracy and data efficiency, but also uh, better calibration, so know better what the models don't know, improved uh, performance on distribution shift, as well as potential unification with other modalities. Next, please. So what does it start with a uh, motivating thought experiment? Well, actually, a real experiment, because I'm going to show you the results. So just take a moment to consider which of these two scenarios uh, you'd expect to work better. So it's a transfer learning setting, and we're going to pre-train two different CNNs. The first network is going to be pre-trained on the one image that data set of one million images, and the other is pre-trained on a much larger and noisier data set, and this is a proprietary data set. Uh, it's not, um, it's similar to images, image net in that it's web images, uh, but not exactly the same. Next, please. Then we will take these two networks, remove the final classification error, and perform a transfer by not only retraining this final error, but also fine tuning the rest of the weights in the network. And the twist in this experiment is that we're going to transfer to ImageNet with just one image per class. So this is not a, a practical setting, of course. We wouldn't pre train an ImageNet and transfer to ImageNet, uh, but it's for an experiment for illustration purposes. And so one needs to retrain this final layer with just 1,000 images, 1,000 classes of image net. And so take a moment to think to yourself what you think might work better. The network that's pre-trained on image net, which is a kind of perfect match to the image net downstream task, or the network that's trained a lot more noisier data, uh, but it's not really such a perfect match to the downstream task. So I'll pause for a second, take a moment to think about what you think would work better. Okay, next please. Now, if you thought these model, these two effects will kind of match and the two models will perform similarly, then you would be right-ish at the smaller scale, but not at all at the bigger scale. So for a RESA 50 size architecture, the JFT model performs a bit better than the ImageNet model, but as the architecture grows, 
the image net to image net transfer doesn't improve at all. Yet the transfer from the large and noisier data set to image net improves a lot. So data is really key to training powerful representations, even when it's, and, and this is better than, than sort of perfect data um, uh, that's uh, the smaller data set. Next, please. As a second motivating example, I'm going to uh, mention a couple of results from the revisiting calibration of modern neural networks from Matthias, who's speaking later, and others. So there's a classic paper, classic-ish now, that looks at the calibration of deep neural networks. And what they found is that these networks can be miscalibrated, and maybe more worrying still, when they're scaled up, they can be even more miscalibrated, which means they cannot predict well when they're likely to be making a mistake. And so in this work, the, uh, this result was revisited but in the context of pre-trained networks, which is very common nowadays. And so one of the main findings of this paper is on the left, and each point corresponds to a model, and the uh, colors correspond to different model classes. And on the x-axis, we have the accuracy, and on the y-axis, the calibration. And on the left-hand plot, we can see that, generally speaking, the models that are more accurate are the ones that are also better calibrated for these kinds of networks. However, uh, there is still some trade-off here. You can see, for example, the yellow points uh, form a kind of Pareto frontier. However, after simple temperature scaling, this mostly disappears, and we see that in the context of modern pre-trained networks, the ones that are the most accurate are also the ones that are most well calibrated, which is reassuring. Next, please. And perhaps more importantly, this holds for outer distribution. So in these experiments, the networks are transferred to ImageNet, but then their calibration is measured on corrupted, the ImageNet C uh, benchmark, which is corrupted versions of ImageNet. And on the y-axis, we have a calibration relative to the largest models. And we can see that as the corruption severity is increased, the smaller models tend to have a larger delta relative to the uh, positive delta relative to the large models, which indicates that uh, in a lot of cases, the calibration or the calibration of all networks decreases when the corruption severity is increased. However, the smaller models, their calibration degrades faster than the large pre-trained model, which is again reassuring uh, for uh, pre-trained foundation models could be division. Next, please. And finally, I'd like to mention uh, the task adaptation benchmark. When we put this together a few years ago, the goal was to measure transfer learning not just to sort of normal natural distributions, but also to medical images, satellite images, and more unusual distributions like uh, DMAB and other sort of synthetic structured environments. And the elevated benchmark proposed by this workshop sort of massively extends over this to introduce lots more interesting tasks, including uh, zero shot and visual language learning plus uh, object detection. Next, please. And what we saw was that when we took some of our best CNNs at the time, uh, these blue bars, that the transfer to natural images was indeed the most effective, but we still saw some gains in the transparent to. Uh, medical images and these structure images uh, when transferring the P bit L, which is the largest CNN at the time. So clearly there's sort of more headroom and more work to be done when transferring to these more outer distribution tasks, but at least the needle is moving in the right direction. Next, please. So these results motivated sort of looking a bit at the scale of pre-trained representation learning, and obviously the larger scale networks to date have been trained in the language domain, and these are all transformers next. Which then motivated, of course, looking into transformers. So I'll first review a couple of the, result, the main results from the vision transformer paper, and then discuss various extensions, and then more detailed look at the scaling laws. Next, please. So there are two main questions when we look at non-convolutional neural networks that could be division that we were thinking about. The first is, if you don't build your reductive biases for the domain into the architecture, in particular, uh, shift equivariance and local, local features, can other models learn these reductive biases directly from the data? And secondly, even if it can be done, is it useful 
or will it be very, very expensive to train such networks and thus not a practical thing to do? Next, please. So this is one of the main figures from the paper that addresses the first of those questions. And so in this figure, we can see the amount of training data on the x-axis and the transfer of forms on the y-axis. And the grayscale curves correspond to some convolutional, uh, standard convolutional networks at the time. And indeed, what we can see at the smaller scale that these models, those inductive biases built for vision, generally help. In fact, they help a lot and the performance is actually larger than the transformers. Yet the trajectory of the transformer when the amount of data is increased is much steeper. And when we use a large amount of data, the performance is better than CNNs. Now, there's a big red asterisk on data here. Uh, it turns out one doesn't actually need lots of data, but one could do alternative things, and I'll reduce that in a couple of slides. Next, please. But maybe more exciting still was that when pre training these transformers, it was actually surprisingly cheap to do so. So it's on the x axis here is pre training compute instead of amount of data. And what we saw is that at all amounts of pre training compute, we could outperform uh, the equivalent uh, equivalent cost of CNNs with the transform based setup. So it wasn't just the big network trained for a long time that it outperformed CNNs, but it was also the small network trained for a small amount of time. This corresponds to the points on the left. Next, please. We also tried some hybrid approaches that are very popular these days, and these are very performant at a smaller scale, but at a larger scale, uh, tend to saturate faster than the uh, pure vision transformer based designs. Next. Okay, so I wanted to return to this asterisk on data, and a lot of the work that's followed uh, from, from the vision transformer has really uh, explored this axis in great depth and has found that, in fact, you don't necessarily need a lot of data to train these networks. You can do a bunch of other things instead. And I don't have time to review the literally hundreds of papers uh, that make advances here, but I'll just recap a couple of the main ideas. Next, please. First, one can use data augmentation or regularization instead of having a large data set. And I think possibly the most well known of these works is the data series of paper papers from Meta AI. Steiner et al. kind of quantified this to uh, indicate that, roughly speaking, if you do extra data augmentation, you can make up for about a 10x uh, increase in size of your data set. Next, please. And then the other main direction is to combine some ideas that make convolutional neural networks work well at smaller scales with the scale of digital transformers, probably the melt, but better. The most well-known paper is the Swim Transformer from Microsoft, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other pyramidal or hierarchical uh, designs that combine uh, different bits of pieces and CNS and transformers, and often can make up uh, for settings when there's not a lot of pre-training data available. Next, please. So a curious aside here, is to look at whether the attention component, um, while it's certainly extremely useful, is fully necessary to train performance vision, perform vision models which don't use convolutions. So there's a few different concurrent uh, approaches here, and the one I'll talk about is, is our work on, on the MLP mixer from the Eric's last year. Next, please. So in this model, it consists of two layers. You have your standard transformer-like MLP layer that takes every visual token and projects it through an MLP. Next, please. But then instead of the self-attention layer, one has another MLP layer that's just a transposed version of the regular MLP layer. So instead of looking at every token in isolation and projecting that to a new token, it looks at every channel or feature in isolation and projects that to a new set of channels or features. Next, please. And it's instructive, I think, to look at the kind of inductive biases in such a model. So in this experiment, we looked at what would happen if we shuffled the patches and the pixels in the images. So this was a deterministic shuffle. Every image is shuffled the same. First, the pixels are commuted within each patch, and then the patches are shuffled. And 
as well can see in the right hand plot, plot below, uh, this is the green curve for a CN, of course, is massively hurts performance because it relies on the local structure within the pixels. But for the MLP based design or indeed for a vision transformer, this transformation doesn't matter at all. And this is kind of counterintuitive that this would be that the network could work in such a setting. But it just indicates the sort of lack of handcrafted inductive biases in the network, that it can work the same whether you do this, have the shuffled image or the original image. Next, please. And what we observed is essentially an extreme version of the previous results with Vision Transformer. So the difference between CNN and Vision Transformer was even further accentuated when we looked at the MLP based architecture. So, you know, with a smaller pre training data set that without extra regularization or augmentation, the, the network performs worse than the Vision Transformer and CNN. But the trajectory as the model is scaled up with respect to the amount of data is even steeper and it catches up vision transformers at a larger scale. And other work has again shown that you can use regularization or augmentation in those cases where you might not have you know, a large image check data set to pre trade on, for example. Next, please. Okay, so this was quite encouraging. Um, but it still remains the fact that, you know, on large data sets, transformers for NLP or vision transformers for vision are relatively costly to train. And that sort of motivated this line of architectural exploration that I'll describe next. Next, please. Now, this paper does a deep study into the main factors that affect the carbon emissions when training large neural networks. And this is, of course, a very important topic. And it focuses entirely on the training of language models. Next, please. And in this plot, they show the size of various language models versus the total number of total amount of compute required to train them. And then these, these two sort of curious points in the bottom right hand corner that are enormous models that are they're not cheap, but they're relatively cheap compared to the other ones. And what makes it possible to build such large networks. Uh, with this sparsely gated mixture expert design that is quite widely used in natural language processing, but is much less explored in computer vision. Next, please. So we explored it. And so we tried to use a transform based mixture of experts for computer vision and see if we could get that same size scaling and size without having uh, a sort of corresponding scaling cost to trade it. So, as a reminder, the data transformer blocks consist of these tokens, and in the case of vision transformers, the tokens could correspond to image patches. One has a self attention layer, and then this pointwise MLP layer. Next, please. And we're going to sparsify in a mixture of experts that MLP layer. So, instead of having a single MLP that's applied to every single token, there are several MLPs. These are what's known uh, informally as the experts. And this will mean that we can have many more parameters, um, but we're going to activate them in a sparse way such that we don't increase the cost of the water plant pass. So there's going to be a series of about four next in rapid succession um, here. So we start with um, the tokens coming in as input that they go through the self attention layer. They then pass through a linear layer that creates a score for every single expert for every single token. And then based on that score, the, the tokens or patches are sent to be processed by the corresponding expert. And most importantly, each patch is not sent to every expert, but it's only sent to a very small subset. And so this means that you know, each parameter is not applied to every single patch, but only to a very sparse number of patches. And by controlling the sparsity factor, one can essentially adjust arbitrarily the cost of the forward pass while having many parameters inside these experts. After the um, tokens have been processed by the corresponding ex experts, we then have k expert outputs per token. And finally, these are combined back into the original tokens um, you, according to the weights prescribed by the original router network. Next, please. 
Okay, okay so, so how does it work? work? We tried it again in the pre-training and transfer learning setup. And we were pleased to see that when we pre-trained these networks, that uh, we could achieve a good performance for a given amount of compute. So in this plot, the x-axis is the total pre-training cost, and the y-axis is the pre-training accuracy. And the triangles correspond to the sparse networks, and the circles correspond to the equivalent um, dead strategic transformers. And the colors sort of uh, align models of a similar shape. And for models of a similar shape, they basically cost the same. It's a tiny bit more expensive to train the MOE model due to the router uh, and its dispatch, which is why the triangles are very tiny bit shifted to the right. Uh, but overall, the pre training cost is similar. And we were quite pleased to see that the sparse models aren't just useful at the very large scale, which is what they're mostly used for in NLP, but they also work well at the small scale, for example, the S32 or B32 architectures, the VMOE equivalents uh, can give better performance, and so that's kind of exciting for exploring these models at small scale as well. Next, please. The same benefits can be seen when we do linear few shot uh, transfer downstream. And finally, uh, we also try fine tuning them. Now, fine tuning is known to be a bit more challenging with a mixture of experts. So we were happy to see that they can be fine tuned well at small and medium scales. Next. At the larger scale, we were however seeing some diminishing returns. And this is a topic I'll return to later in the talk. Next, please. So, so something interesting that one can do with these sparse, sparse networks. Uh, next. So, so I mentioned that the tokens get sent to these experts, and they always get sent in a fixed order. And if you have a perfect balancing of assignment of tokens to experts, then all the tokens get process, processed. However, in reality, you're not going to get this perfect balance. There's going to be some imbalance in the way the router prescribes which experts should be assigned to which tokens. And what this means is that some tokens will end up not being processed because you only have a fixed capacity per expert for implementation reasons. And so which tokens get dropped is completely arbitrary, but depends on the order of the images in the batch. So the very first token in the batch is guaranteed success when it's routed to a particular expert. Next, please. But the last token in the batch is almost surely going to get dropped uh, because you're unlikely to have a perfect assignment. And so this sort of arbitrary dropping of tokens feels like a bit of a bug in such models. But the question is whether one can sort of convert this into a feature by doing something smart. Next, please. And so this is the idea behind batch prioritized routing, is we're actually going to explicitly um, choose which tokens are more likely to get processed and which tokens are more likely to get dropped. And we do this by dispatching the tokens in an order corresponding to their router confidence. So if the router is very confident that a certain token should go to a certain expert, then it is then its routing is prioritized over another token that's been sent to that expert, but with a lower confidence score. Next, please. And so, so one can see this in this, uh, this example. If we have high capacity experts, every token gets processed. If we have a limited capacity, then sort of arbitrary tokens will get dropped, so the one might not be able to predict what's in the image. But with batch prioritized routing, it prioritizes sort of the most salient tokens to get processed first. And that might give enough expert uh, information to classify the image correctly. Next, please. And what we saw with batch prioritized routing is that one could purposefully limit the capacity in the expert layers to about 30% of process about 30% of the tokens. And one wouldn't lose much performance, but if one didn't use back prioritization, then one would, one would uh, lose a lot of performance. So this is sort of a curious feature uh, of these fast models that I think can be further exploited. Next, please. Okay, so, so far I've sort of spoken about transformers and mixers and sparse transformers, and they seem to have quite a good scalability with, with compute and um, data. But in this next section, we'll look at trying to quantify that a little bit uh, more precisely. Yeah, Neil, next, we have five minutes left. Yeah. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. So in this plot, we looked at the scaling laws of the 
vision transformer. And in the plot, the redder architecture is larger and the bigger points are trained with more data. So in the interest of time, I think Matthias will hit next four times. And one more. Okay, perfect. So I'll turn everything one go. So there's a couple of interesting features here. First, we can see that the larger blue points fall behind the Pareto frontier. So the Pareto frontier is cost and accuracy, and so down the left is cheaper and more accurate. And we can see that if we use, if we have a lot of images, then it's not really a good idea to use a B architecture because it can't make use of them. Similarly, the small pink points that fall behind the frontier are models that cannot be saturated even with 100 million images, which is kind of surprising that you need so many images to saturate them. In this setting, there's no data augmentation. So um, maybe you want to use less images than want to use data augmentation. But perhaps most importantly is the overall behavior. So you have this power law behavior in the middle, which corresponds to the straightish line on the log block axis. But as we get to higher degrees of accuracy, we can see that there's a curve. And this demonstrates some kind of diminishing returns as well as scaling up. And this could be due to two reasons. It could either be that the model's not learning anything new by the larger, it's kind of extracted all the information it can out of this large scale um, image based retraining. Um, or it could be that the downstream task is not sensitive enough. Next, please. So just, just to say that this, this study was done on a, a large proprietary data set, but one can see the same effects if one does the same thing or study on the public image net for the k data. Next, please. And the same general trend holds if we look at many other tasks. So this is the same, same models for the evaluated on several different downstream tasks. Overall, it is power law region, as we see in language models. But you see in most cases, this evidence of saturation is starting to appear in very large and higher accuracy models. You'll probably note here that uh, some of the curves are uh, not too accurate in the, in the high accuracy region, which motivated some improved uh, scaling law, uh, coming up with some improved scaling laws. And that'll be the, what I presented in just the last two minutes. So next, obviously a lot of motivation for better scaling laws, you do faster experimentation, you have architecture search, a small scale, et cetera. Next, please. But when scaling laws are really useful, and not just when they explain the data you've already got, i.e. they interpolate well, but they can extrapolate to uh, the case where you might have many more uh, data points or much more compute. And in this toy example here, one can see that effect. So if one fits different power laws to the observed green points, then one gets uh, different interpolation and extrapolation errors on the new yellow points. And perhaps interestingly, the best power law coefficient for interpolation is not the best power law coefficient for extrapolation. And so one wants a scaling law that when fit on the interpolation data also extrapolates well, because then it can be useful for predicting what might happen in the future. And so this is what we're studying in this revisiting your scaling, scaling laws paper, this to appear in your list. And so the new estimator is based on a few um, assumptions. The first assumption is that the scaling law can be decomposed into two sigmoid-like functions. One that in the limit describes the behavior when you have an infinitely cheap model, like you don't see any data and you just predict the sort of average class or the most popular class. And the other limit where you have infinite data of compute and you kind of fully saturated the task. The second assumption is that in the limit, it starts to look like a saturating power law, as is used commonly in language. And the third assumption is that you know, within this power law region, the law can be reduced uh, to a power law as a special case. And so based on the assumptions, one um, law that satisfies that is described at the bottom. And it has some advantage over the, over the ones we fit to the previous vision data. Uh, in particular, the epsilons, which describe the limiting behaviors, can be fit independently of the other parameters, and the other parameters can be fit with least squares. So it's kind of a better conditioned uh, law for fitting uh, than the previous one I showed. Next, please. And this estimator, which is called M4, in these figures, uh, is observed to get uh, better uh, it's better extrapolation performance. Next, please. 
And this is observed across uh, a number of image classification tasks, but also it works well on element neural machine translation, language modeling, and on the big bench language understanding benchmark. So next slide, I will wrap up here. Uh, just to summarize this sort of intro to our three talks, 13 units of pre-trained models uh, motivated by not just image classification, but a number of different types of metrics. We've seen that transformers and sparse transformers scale pretty well. And I presented some scaling or estimators for, uh, uh, for describing this behavior uh, quantitatively. And finally, our signals indicate that there may be some possible saturation when we train these larger models, at least on these image classification benchmarks. So I think uh, I've got some time, so I'll wrap up here and hand on to the next speaker.